Despite questions concerning the reliability of Greek scholars and historians like Diodorus Siculus and Herodotus, their work highlights a very important narrative that did exist in ancient times. Whether their words about Africa were true or not, they expose what the common discourse was in ancient times amongst elites, an ancient commentary that influenced later periods. Some of the ancient narratives suggest the belief or at least the consideration that Africans were the first people and also that they were among the first civilized. Now the Ethiopians, as historians relate, were the first of all men and the proofs of this statement they say are manifest. For that they did not come into their land as immigrants from abroad but were natives of it and so justly bear the name of Autochthons is, they maintain, conceded by practically all men. Furthermore, that those who dwell beneath the noonday sun were, in all likelihood, the first to be generated by the earth, is clear to all, since inasmuch as it was the warmth of the sun which, at the generation of the universe, dried up the earth when it was still wet and impregnated it with life. It is reasonable to suppose that the region which was nearest the sun was the first to bring forth living creatures. I find it fascinating that a Greek scholar came to a similar conclusion as we did concerning the origin of humans, placing them on the African continent. Echoes of this narrative survived into more modern times. One of the most popular Orientalists known today as the general title Middle Eastern Studies was a man named Constantine de Volney of the 18th century. Here's what he has to say. We have the strongest reasons to believe that the country neighboring to the tropic Sudan and southern Egypt was the cradle of the sciences and of consequence that the first learned nation was a nation of blacks, for it is incontrovertible that by the term Ethiopians, the ancients meant to represent a people of black complexion, thick lips, and woolly hair. Despite what our perspective is today, People in ancient times and even some of the earliest observers concluded that humanity's oldest civilizations and people were Africans. The lands to the south of Egypt, generally called Nubia, had five important golden ages. The first golden age, which was called Tarseti. Some people call that, in translation, the land of the bow. This civilization was older than First Dynasty Egypt by about 200 years. The ancient Egyptians themselves said that they came from the south of, of Kemet, ancient Egypt, which is further up, higher up the Nile Valley, closer to the source. And they identified the mountains of the moon, which are in modern day Uganda, as their place of origin. Most historians now accept, even the European Eurocentric ones, that it is the movement of the peoples from the south to the north that gave birth to Kemet. However, what they fail to recognize is that it's not just the movement of these one set of Africans traveling from the south to the north, but also movements of other Africans coming from the west to the east. They met and collected together in what is now Kemet. That's why that civilization was so powerful, because it was a multicultural expression of the African experience. It was several sets of different Africans coming together in one place and creating a civilization. This is a place where early Europeans came to study and learn from Africans, and to study from the oldest people in the world, Africans. So when you hear recent discussions on oh, who were the black pharaohs, referring in particular to the Nubian pharaohs or the Cushitic pharaohs. Those pharaohs, they often call black pharaohs in a way to try and distinguish them from the others, but they can't be. Because as we said, all the early dynastic and intermediate pharaohs were black. This is home to the world's oldest recorded religion, a place whose kingship and political system continued to bring harmony and prosperity to its people for over 3,000 years. 
So like as women, black men are also very diverse. We can pretty much characterize black men into three major categories based on major language phylum. You have the Niger Congo man, which is the black man's primary and most dominant language group. Then you have the Nilo Saharan and the Afrasan black man. Black men's major civilization can be broken up by region. In West Africa, it was Wagadu, Mali, and Songhai. In Central and Southern Africa, it was Kanem, Congo, and Great Zimbabwe. And in Eastern Africa, he had Meroe, Egypt, and Aksum. These classical civilizations of Africa exemplify in part who the black man is and gives us clues concerning his nature. Upon studying these civilizations, you'll realize how different and diverse they all are, but more importantly, how his tremendous diversity impacted his story. You see, like all men, black men were never unified under any racial identity, but by ethnic or language group. But because the diversity of black men was so much more significant in size, this became in many ways his burden. The inherent beauty of black men and his greatness is his diversity, as it greatly contributed to the entire genetic fabric of our planet, literally building what we know today as a human race. But this greatness was also his weakness because due to the gravity of his diversity, he was never able to consistently conquer himself advancing a unified social or cultural political meaning amongst his brothers. Black men were the first men to consume and digest the idea of God, at times even elevating himself and especially his women to the level of a deity. His religion is what continued to drive his thinking and even advance him into a civilized human being as religion demanded it. He began creating structures like at Napta Playa in the Nubian desert, which was an astronomical observance. And according to some scholars began one of the first cultures of sculpture development. According to some scholars, the man who sparked this culture in Africa seems to have been the Nilo Saharan black man arising from Sub-Saharan Africa. As this Nilo-Saharan man moved further north, his experience changed slightly, and he began to develop what would later be adored by humanity. Preserving the human anatomy in stone and even measuring our place in the universe through astronomical observance, expressing our importance as humans. Once you think highly of yourself and a human body, you must then create institutions to preserve and protect it. And it was this man that is believed to have founded the first significant civilization in Africa, Ta Seti. This Nilo-Saharan black man is important to our understanding of the black man's first thought. And once we understand it, we realize he sparked what would later become a religion in African high societies. Now, the Niger Congo black man seems to have been very different from his brothers. It was the Niger Congo man that seems to have developed the most significant conquering spirit on the continent. As he apparently saw the need to expand his influence, he was the first to do this and was immensely successful at it, nearly taking the whole continent during the Bantu expansion. There is no doubt the Niger Congo black man is the most dominant presence on the continent. In fact, even though there is no direct evidence of this, his expansion might be the very reason why we see Nilo-Saharan man further north. Given all of this, it would seem as though the Niger-Congo man helped to maintain and promote the matrilineal system of the entire continent, a system that his brothers seemed to embrace he also seemed to be the first to train his brain with mathematics with the presence of the Ashango bone. Mathematics, of course, being one of the bedrocks of civilization. 
The ideas of the Nilo-Saharan black man seems to have been borrowed and further developed by the Afrasan black man. This Afrasan man seems to have been unique as it was him that popularized the idea that the black man himself was God. He also popularized and improved upon the culture of his brother, the Nilo-Saharan with writing, culture, and statehood. The Afrasan black man and his geographical proximity to the rest of the world assigned him with being the carrier of African culture and religion, exposing and introducing it to the rest of the world. Historically, it was his civilization that became the most recognizable and relatable to the rest of the world. Despite the vast diversity of all these black men, the Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan, and Afra Sam black men, there seems to be one characteristic that unifies them, or at least dominates their nature, their core. It stems from a subconscious belief seemingly inherent to all black men. The belief that he is morally superior or in other words, morally responsible for mankind as if he'd been assigned by nature itself. The same way the Kushites believe the Egyptian culture ultimately belonged to them, thus making them morally responsible for its corruption. So too does the black man subconsciously believe that he is the first man creating the first culture and the first civilization. Thus, according to him, he is burdened with supervising the moral compass of mankind. Why? Because in his eyes, nature itself assigned it to him. This belief, ironically, causes a very peculiar disposition amongst black men, which we'll call moral complacency a disposition in which he very rarely fights against. So how does this moral complacency tangibly play itself out? Well, the Niger Congo, Nilo Saharan and Afra San never expanded outside the continent with the sole purpose of gaining resources and or wealth. The acquisition of land for black men had very little, if anything at all, to do with his feeling of worth or superiority. So ultimately, what is moral complacency and how does it fit in with the story of black men? As black men left his home in Africa, he planted his seed across the entire planet. Every continent we look, we see pieces of his presence. But something happened that black men did not expect. He began to change due to his environment. In many ways, black men was shaping nature around him and nature was loyal to him. But little did he know that nature was also shaping him. Thus, as time passed, the nature of his genetic, cultural and spiritual seed began to be very different from what he remembers. This is the origin of his fear. Black men descend from a continent with plenty of land and resources, so there never really seemed to develop a sense of urgency to survive and at times even compete. The key word here being urgency. Like mentioned before, black men were no strangers to diversity and, and language barriers amongst himself. But unfortunately, because of this, he assumed every foreign man he encountered had a similar nature to his own. One of his ills is his struggle to understand the motives behind other men that seek to destroy him, as he seems to have developed no need to genetically survive, as his genes and his subconscious opinion have been distributed throughout the entire earth long ago. And he also never developed an incessant need to feel superior to others Perhaps to his fault, in a cosmic sort of way, in all men, he sees a sort of molecular piece of himself. This phenomenon, which I call moral complacency, seems to be unique to black men. 
Because of this, black men, especially today, largely succeed only as an individual. His greatness is seldom used to advance his own nation. Why? Mostly internal, but also some external factors apply. But ultimately, because on a primordial level, he believes the world is his nation, as it originally belonged to him. His moral superiority has usually harmed him. That is his blessing and his curse, and though it provides him at times with cognitive dissonance, oddly enough, that is the only way he learned to be human. In essence, the only way he truly understands being human, and he feels burdened to teach mankind how to be like what he remembers, what he understands as human. The black man's greatest fear, no matter how irrational, is not that he will be annihilated because to him that is simply impossible. The black man's greatest fear is coming to terms with the idea that the earth no longer belongs to him, that the earth abandoned its original creation, that he will not be the source of the earth's future evolution, that he will not be the source and the origin of humanity's next phase. That his idea of human is not what nature assigned it to be. This is why he remains morally complacent even when faced with the destruction of his own nation because his moral complacency allows him to infiltrate himself in other nations, being the driver of its culture, becoming the ghostwriter for the social cultural evolution of our planet. This is why he has no issue being successful as an individual in a society he did not create, because in that, in his primal opinion, the earth will continue to belong to him, and he can continue to define what a human is. You see, back then, as he planted his seed across the planet in the beginning, he only saw himself and one version of humanity, but of course this has changed. This is not the humanity he has come to know and understand. Thus, in his moral superiority, he will do anything to remain the driver of what he feels humanity is, cultivating its culture and its worldview, even at the expense of his own nation. However, the question is, is his commitment to moral complacency worth it? In other words, are his fears of an unfamiliar humanity worth his nation? This is a question that black men are beginning to ask himself right now in the 21st century. What is the value of my moral superiority and will nature continue to honor it? And when we as black men finally answer this question, whatever the answer may be, it will greatly determine the social, political, and spiritual tone for the entire planet for the next 500 years. Why? Well, because black men have always been the spark of humanity's cultural and spiritual significance. He founded the first human moral codes. Let's really think about the subconscious of black men who was the first celebrated and well-known black man in African history? His name was Asar. And what did Asar concern himself with in life? The first thing that Asar did was teach others how to be human, how to be morally upright, and how to build civilization. This was the first championed image of a man that black men develop for himself. The first thought of black men, his first celebrated figure in his mind, advanced characteristics of teaching men how to be human, teaching them a morally proper worldview. And what happened to Osar? He was killed and dismembered and later his wife brought his pieces together and wrapped it up in the first ever mummification process. For the black man, mummification exemplifies the importance of the human body, but more importantly, 
what the human body means and it represents. The first man was morally upright, teaching the world the idea of what a man is and what a human is. And it was him who was the first to be mummified or preserved. To the black man, preserving this ideal man or ideal human is of utmost importance to him. Even though black men have been dehumanized and despised by all groups of non-Africans, ironically, he alone invented the human institutions that became the only thing separating man from beast, art, culture, and civilization. This tradition is continued amongst his sons. Non-Africans continue to obsess and absorb and even mimic the black man's art and culture, but despise its creator. But strangely enough, that's not even the black man's burden. The black man's burden is not that he is oppressed and forgotten. His burden is being the moral, cultural, and spiritual compass of the human spirit. His curse is that he constantly seeks validation from which he deems the first reflection of his creator, nature which in his subconscious mind may or may not be loyal to him anymore. Despite his extraordinary resilience to the most gruesome act in human history, his survival and his patience with humanity is unrivaled. One of his greatest attributes, which in many ways became a driver for his survival, is his creativity. Black men have continually done things that has not been done by any man on the planet. It's a rather impressive accomplishment. As most men on the planet needed the sword to do so, black men has done it with his mind. Well, what is it? It's his culture. The culture of black men is the only thing that has genuinely conquered the world. And that has become his greatest weapon for preserving his idea of human.